A special presentation from the KTBB News Group. Bronco Roundup Game Day starts now. Well, it has been one of the more significant weeks in the history of the Boise State football program. Shocking to most, last Sunday, head coach Andy Avalos became the first head coach to be fired in season in program history. Hired to lead his alma mater back in 2001, his tenure ends just three, just shy of three full seasons at his alma mater. Welcome live inside Maverick Stadium here on the campus of Utah State in Logan, Utah. Jay Tuss alongside Brady Frederick. It is game day for the Boise State football team. The second to last game of the regular season for the Broncos. Everything's still in play, but first the Broncos have to overcome what's been a lot of distractions this season. That's right, Jay. Happy game day to you as Happy well. Game day. And uh, I, I think that one of the big storylines or what would have been the big storyline had we not had a chaotic week, bull eligibility on the right. line today, both for Boise State and Utah State. Tough games for each of these teams the following week. We're going to see an exciting rivalry bout. Yeah. Let's give you a live look at the field. The guys are warming up behind us as we speak. The good news, we did see Ashton Genty out warming up when the guys initially got on the field and out of the locker room today. It looks like Boise State will be without Dimitri Washington and tight end Riley Smith yet again for this contest. We'll have a full injury update coming your way in just a little bit. We're also going to break down what it will take for Boise State to get to a bowl game. Who do they need to lose? I'll give you a little hint right now. One of them is losing right now. So that's some good news right there. But we do have to begin with what really has been the news of the week. Given the way the season has gone and what sources close to the program have recently told me about the culture and it's their concern about the culture, it's difficult to call this news shocking, but the timing of Andy Avalos' firing is a little surprising. Let's give you a timeline of a 12-hour window between last Saturday night and Sunday just before noon. At 11.30 p.m. on Saturday, Boise State finished off a 42-14 victory over New Mexico. At 10.19 the following morning on Sunday, ESPN's Pete Thamel reported that Avalos was set to be dismissed from the program. At 10.45 a.m., sources told us that a last Last-minute team meeting had been scheduled for 11 a.m. And the players, well, they weren't supposed to report back to the facility until later that evening. Then at 11 a.m., we were able to confirm the Avalos had indeed been dismissed. On Monday, Jeremiah Dickey explained his decision. Yesterday was a tough day. Uh, I, I care very much about Andy, and once a Bronco, always a Bronco is, is something that's important to us. And and you know, it was one of the tougher decisions that I had to make. I've never been a fan of making a decision in season, but my goal always when making tough decisions is for my head, my heart, and my gut to align. And once that took place, I felt it was the right decision at that point in time. So here is a look at how Andy Avalos' resume stacks up to the people that previously held his position at Boise State. As you can see, Andy lost more games in his short time with the Broncos than all of his predecessors had. Andy had some decent success in conference, going 17-6 and six overall, but you could see a goose egg in the conference championship column. His performance on the blue probably also a little bit of a concern, especially within Bronco Nation. Boise State typically has one of the best home field advantages in all of college football, but as you can see here as we flip on over to winning percentages, Andy significantly below what many thought was the standard at Boise State, and uh, a 667 winning percentage on the blue for Andy Avalos just didn't quite cut it. Now this is video from around 11.30 a.m. last Sunday, just outside the Gene Blameyer Fuchs football complex. Sophomore quarterback Taylon Green was a bit of a late arrival. The notice was so short that some of the guys couldn't even get to the facility for the start of the interview. I'm told Spencer Danielson addressed the team at that point in time. He will serve as the interim head coach for the rest of the season. We're going to have more on that in just a minute. But first, approximately 90 minutes after that scheduled meeting ended, you could see some of the guys emerging from the building. Team captains DJ Schramm and Riley Smith all leaving the building along with Green and Alexander Tubner. 
So with the change in leadership, Boise State Athletic Director Jeremiah Dickey announced that defensive coordinator Spencer Danielson would be finishing out the season as the interim head football coach. We asked Dickey if Danielson was going to be a candidate for the official head coaching job. He told us that's a discussion that they have to have a little bit later. For now, Danielson only has one thing on his mind. It's finishing out these final two games and whatever potentially lies beyond that, strong for the players on this team. I'm very excited for the opportunity because I love these kids. It's not about me, it's about them. It's about those seniors that from, they've been through COVID together, they've been through all these times together. It's about them. And that's the only reason I coach anyway. It's not because the X's and O's on the board, the line's on the board, it's about them. I told them there's, if there's anything they need and our coaches, our staff's done a great job keeping them together, that's our focus. Finish, two weeks, two weeks, and then let's look up and see where we're at. Well, again, we're going to get you that live look on the field that you only get here on Channel 7, the official station for Bronco Nation. The specialists out warming up on the field as we speak, getting ready to go. An interesting ball game. Boise State, again, needs a win today to get bowl eligible come December. Colt Fulton uh, in the groove right there. A few weeks ago, he finally got on the field and executed a perfect two-point conversion. So we'll see if Boise State has a little fun and maybe dips into the bag of tricks today here in Logan. Now, as far as what's coming up on the show today, um, we have a lot. I've already broken some of it down for you, but we're going to look at how Taylor Green is beginning to bounce back. That's in about 10 minutes or so. Interesting takes from uh, Bush Hamden, who remains very, very confident and expects Green to play well today. A few minutes after that, the unsung hero of Boise State's offense, kind of an, an unknown name that's making a big impact, just kind of subtly. Okay, Kala Canijo, the former Boise State safety, is going to break it down. And then, of course, we're also going to look at another special teamer for this team, Brady, the best punter in the country. Yeah, James Ferguson Reynolds, the punter from down under, always taking care of the ball on his holding operations, making Jonah Domus look as great to his full potential. By the way, Jay, caught up with Steve Domus in the stands just a second ago. Uh, he was he was sitting right where I imagine Jonah's going to be knocking some through tonight. Yep. Uh, he said it's going to be a beautiful day. Bucket hat and all, no wind, at least field level. The field kind of sinks in. Uh, it's in that kind of a, a bowl, so kickers actually do like kicking here, despite the fact it is a little cold. But you can see him right there, James Ferguson Reynolds. We're going to hear from him just a little bit later on in the show. Was on a pretty important watch list this week, or not even a watch list anymore, a semifinalist list that is a big-time honor for him. In the meantime, though, we are going to kind of get back to the coaching change at this point. Something is very difficult to navigate in the middle of the season. Something Boise State is attempting to tackle right now, Brady. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something that could be hard on the players, but it sure seems like Jeremiah Dickey picked the right guy to take over as the interim head coach. We went to practice this week. You can see just high energy throughout mm -hmm. the players. Danielson made it clear he's not worried about getting the official head coaching job, and you can tell from any BSU press conference if you ever listen into the defensive coordinator, uh, he loves coaching these guys. It means a lot to him. He wants to make a positive impact on these players and whatever happens next uh, he's glad he has the opportunity to do that for the remainder of this week throughout the roster by the way they, they're all excited it's not just the defense players it's the offense it's the special teamers they're fired up to play for coach D guys here love that man and people here would run through a brick wall for that man I would do anything for coach Danielson I don't want to get too far into it, but I think that he's definitely ready to step into a head coaching role. He's done a great job over the past two days of uh, exceeding my expectations. You know, he's a great coach. Um, I mean, even better, man. You know, the, the conversations we have, the talks we have, the real talks, you know, just the person he is. He's someone I love being around, and I'm super excited for him. Coach, he's awesome. I mean, He's so great, uh, and that locker room is so fired up to finish this for him. And guys are just fired up to be out there and uh, be playing for each other and uh, playing for their coaches and playing for Coach D. All right, let's look at the tail of the tape for today's matchup. There is a game that needs to be played after all. It's kind of like these two programs are almost looking in the mirror, Brady. Both are averaging over 30 points per game on offense. They also both rank in the top 30 in the country in total offense. Neither squad has been particularly good on defense this season. This year, the Broncos, uh, as you can see, the numbers aren't great, but they are trending in the right direction compared to Utah State. They rank 71st and 76th respectively in scoring defense and yards allowed per game. As we take it back out live on the field, 
Again, the specialists getting warmed up. Uh, the position players, the skill players, if you will, are going to join them shortly. You see some of the coaches coming out. And I do want to shift our attention back to the coaching, coaching search for just a second here because um, this is a, a, a tough week for, for many involved. You know, it, when there's a head coaching change at the top, there are a lot of people that lose their jobs, Brady. Uh, most of the staff probably going to be gone. They'll have to sit and wait and see if the next head coach wants to retain anybody. But this is a difficult week for, week for a lot of people involved. Andy Avalos isn't the only one that, you know, effectively is, is losing his job. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it starts with the offensive and defensive coordinator. When a new head coach comes to Boise State, I mean, he, he might like what the, he gets out of those guys, but he might have his own guys that he wants to bring yep. in. And I'll tell you what, it, it feels like the players know that. They, yeah. they talk about how much of a man of character Spencer Danielson is, how much they, they respect him not only as a coach but as a person. That's one of the reasons I think they're going to get the, their best they're going to give their best to the guy because they, they want to make him look good yeah. he, he, as he starts the application process potentially in a couple weeks. Yeah, we're going to hear from the players uh, throughout this show, and I, I think you're going to see some joy on their faces in all honesty. They, it, there is a, a refreshed feeling, if you will. I know one thing that Boise State interim head coach Spencer Danielson did this week, he dialed back the practice schedule a little bit, wanted to make things a little more efficiently, get guys in and out of the building as quickly as he could so that he could get them home. Something else he did last night, he gave the players an extra hour with their families on the road. Usually they only get one. He extended that window to a two-hour period. I really like some of the things that he's doing because these kids are going through a difficult time right now, and they don't need to necessarily be pushed more than they already have been. At least that's, that's my opinion. Um, when it comes to the coaching search, you know, Unfortunately, I, I don't know if, if Spencer Danielson necessarily has an inside track to this thing. And um, it will be interesting to see if he truly is a candidate, I would say, as well. From my understanding, you know, it, it seems like going outside the family might be a direction that they could target, but it's a national search. That's what Jeremiah Dickey said. He was going to launch a national search for the next head coach, and they're certainly trying to go through that process right now, Brady. Still kind of early, but I will say this. When we talk about the significance of firing Andy Avalos with two games to go in the season, uh, th again, this is my take on this, is that they can kind of use football right now almost as a distraction, right? The transfer portal opens on December 4th. For right now, technically, it is open for Boise State football players. The team is holding together right now for at least two games because that's all that's guaranteed that's left on the schedule. Using football as a distraction, and then maybe Jeremiah Dickey can solidify the future and they give hope, and that's why Boise, some of these guys would would stay here and not necessarily test the transfer portal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at the fact that the transfer portal is already open, I think that does say something about the culture that this team has, especially in a time that's potentially in turmoil. No one's left yet that, we, that we've heard about, and that's, I that's can, a... I can confirm that at this point. Yeah. Nobody has actually entered the transfer portal so far from Boise State. Heck, even Eric McAllister has not technically entered the transfer portal yet. We'll give you an update on his status coming up a little bit later on on the pregame show as well. First off, though, Let's talk about something that is is more uh, lighthearted, I guess. Uniforms. Uh, hey, this is important stuff. This Jay. is important stuff, but uniforms, right? We like to give you this update on the Bronco Roundup game day show. Boise State rocking the white helmets, the white jerseys, the blue pants. What do you think? I love it. I, I think I think it's clean. I, I think there's nothing that really clashes or is distracting. Uh, it, maybe not my favorite, but. It, but definitely solid, and I do kind of like it. It reminds me a little bit of the Utah State jerseys. Not Obviously a different blue. I, I would never try to claim it's the same blue. But it kind of has that vibe of like, hey, we're going to go into your house. We're going to wear your clothes. We're going to smack you around, and we're going to go back to voice. My, my only take on it, and I know they can't wear them every game, I would have put the blue chrome face mask on it. I'm a big fan of the blue chrome face mask. By the way, Boise State all-time in this exact getup. Four and three. When they wear the white helmet, the white jersey, and the blue pants, they are four and three all time. You're getting an up close look at Mason Hutton, the starting long snapper for the Boise State football team. Nice crowd here starting to filter in for Bronco Nation, too. You can hear them as the players start to come back out on the field. And well, you can see right behind us, TG10 taking the field. He is expected to start this game after having his 19 consecutive start streak snap. 
last week against New Mexico, Brady. Yeah, and it's going to be exciting to see him back out there. I mean, if we remember, if we look back to last season, Taylor Green's game against Utah State, potentially his best of the season. It was a lot of fun to watch. We're talking four touchdowns passing, 220 passing yards, and then a rushing touchdown. Not just any rushing touchdown, by the way. 91 yards, goal line to goal line, essentially. Something that Utah State, I mean, anybody who asked, we're like, yeah, thanks for reminding me about that back-breaking right? play. How about that shot, by the way, right in the huddle? up close and personal again you're only getting this shot on the official station for bronco nation right here on idaho's news channel 7 ktvb.com and ktvb plus you see the true freshman cj tiller getting warmed up at the goal line he has yet to appear in a game so far this season freshmen or actually anyone for that matter that hasn't redshirted can still preserve their red shirt as long as they play in four games or fewer he has yet to appear in a game this season so maybe this will be the time that he makes his debut. In well, ideally, honesty, though, I, in, a, in a blowout hey, win scenario, not another two exactly. quarterback I'm system. Exactly. I'm right there with you. I was just going to say, I'm all tailing green tonight, though. Have a game, kid. Don't look over your shoulder to the sideline. This is finally his show once again, Brady. Yeah, and he deserves it. I mean, we've talked about it throughout this season. The character that both Taylor Green and Maddox Madison showed throughout this season to make the two quarterback system work. And I remind you, these are both underclassmen. It's really impressive, and you cannot take for granted the fact that it wouldn't have worked in certain programs. But I, these are two upstanding young men. I agree with you. I agree with you. The best of Maddox. Hey, you can see some of the running backs warming up on the field. That's Troy Wilkie. The, red, uh, the uh, freshman walk-on out of Rocky Mountain High School, just beyond him a moment ago, we showed you number two, Ashton Genty, out on the field. We'll keep it here while we talk, you, talk to you about him. It, sure, it's been a chaotic week, but the good news is, is that he returned to practice this week. He was seen in a yellow non-contact jersey, but you can see him right there out on the field warming up. A noticeable brace on his right knee, which normally he doesn't play with, but Ashton has missed each of the last two games and most of that Wyoming game three weeks ago. Prior to practice yesterday, uh, Spencer Danielson, the interim head coach, told us that they're going to be careful with how they use Ashton, but they are excited to have number two back in the lineup today. Now, after all the time he missed, We'll just go ahead and keep it here because this is the shot you want to see. I'm going to talk about some numbers, though. He has 187 touches on the season. Even though he's missed almost three full games, that still ranks 18th in the FBS and leads the Mountain West Conference. His total yards, 7th in the FBS, leads the Mountain West Conference. His 15 total touchdowns tied for fourth in the country, second in the Mountain West. And he's number one in the league and in all of college football, averaging 164.6 yards from scrimmage per game this season. Earlier this week, Bush Hamden shared his thoughts about the return of Ashton Genty. Uh, you know, I think he's he's working hard to get back. He certainly is. That guy's a football player. I don't think it matters what the situation is. Uh, I think it's it's tough for him to watch and be on the sidelines, if you will. And so you guys know what I think of him and, and, and how I felt about him from the day I got here. Uh, and certainly I think it'd be a huge lift for this team. I think it'd be a huge lift for him, for us to uh, to get him back. Oh, that's huge. We obviously know where that one's at on the roster. You know and want it to matter. You know and want it to be an impactful game, and it, and it typically is. You, you just know when you get there, it, it's going to be a packed stadium with a lot on the line, and hopefully two really, really good football teams playing for something that's important. They're always loaded with great talent. Uh, much respect to them. It's always fun going against them, you know, especially being Utah State. For us, it, it's it's a rivalry game, you know. We just love the competitiveness and getting to play against um, some of the best in the conference. Boise seems to always just get the edge on us. 2021, even when we won the championship, they smoked us in our home stadium. And then this past year, the last game of the year, we, we fought hard and almost came back to win it right at the end, but they still edged us out. So it's exciting just with the opportunity to, to be able to go out and play them again this year. And they're a great team. They always play hard. and. Obviously, they're always at the top of the conference, so it's always a big game for us. So here is a look at the updated Mountain West Conference standings. Both, is, uh, both these teams have plenty on the line tonight. Someone will walk out of Maverick Stadium with a precious victory that will make them bowl eligible. As you can see, the Broncos have a slight edge on the Aggies, at least for now. 
in the Mountain West standings thanks to a big time blowout win over New Mexico last week. Now it's kind of safe to call the 2023 Boise State football team one of the crazier stories, not only um, in program history, but really in college football right now. You know, they've lost five games in a single season for just the third time in about 25 years. They have had one of the youngest uh, rosters in college football this year in terms of the players they've actually used on game day. They've used a rotating quarterback system in all but one game this year. And oh, by the way, they fired their head coach in season for the first time ever, Brady. Yeah, and throughout all those ups and downs, I mean, injuries have been another huge role. Boise State remains in contention for the Mountain West title. Not fully in control of their own destiny. They will need a little bit of help from some Mountain West opponents, but not too much has to happen. A lively fan base here. You can hear them coming alive right now. Taylor Green warming up on the field. We're going to show you some video right now because according to ESPN's Football Power Index, the Broncos have a 63% chance of winning today and a 61% chance of beating Air Force on the blue next week. Now, when you add it all up, FPI gives Boise State an 86% chance of getting bowl eligible and an 8.1% chance of winning the Mountain West. Now, if that percentage seems small, I'm going to tell you, it's actually doubled in the last week. So there is a path for Boise State not just to get to the title game, but potentially win the title, even though the odds are against them at the moment. Let's show you what kind of has to happen as everything plays out over these next couple of weeks. If Air Force, Boise State, San Jose State all end up at six and two, then Boise State would have the necessary tiebreakers to host the Mountain West Conference Championship on December 2nd. The same can be said if it's just Air Force and Boise State at six and two. The Broncos would then claim the head to head, head tiebreaker over the Falcons. Should Boise State and Fresno State finish six and two, then the Broncos would have to travel back down to the Big Raisin for a championship game on December 2nd. You're going to notice UNLV is not on this graphic. Well, in any scenario where Boise State and UNLV end up tied, the computer rankings would determine that tiebreaker. Considering UNLV is currently eight and two, they would likely earn the right to host the Mountain West Conference Championship game. If Boise State does want to get to the title, they need Taylor Green to play well. I remember when he came in, I was like, well, this guy can ball. He's he's really good. So just seeing him play in real life, he's a big, strong dude, fast, and he can throw the ball as well. So I'm excited to watch him play this year. He, he's awesome. I think he's one of the best athletes we saw all last season. I'm, you know, really scares you to death just how good he can really be. The ability to take what could have been, you know, five, six, seven yard gain and turn it into a, a touchdown. You've got to defend him every snap. And it's not just his feet. I mean, he threw the ball so well in that game, especially early in that game. He's a dual threat quarterback. So, you know, he's not just one sided. He has a lot of weapons. He's big, fast, strong, he can throw the ball. So trying to contain that and make him one sided, it's, it's not easy to do. But, you know, that's the only way that um, you could beat them, especially being a freshman in the way he played last year. I know that his future is very bright and much respect to him. <laughs> you know, it's been an interesting season for Taylor Green. I don't think it went as scripted, right? Everybody was so excited. His season as a sophomore was so hyped coming into this year. And you look at it, six touchdowns, six interceptions. He lost the starting quarterback job. He's regained it. The good news for him, he has a chance to make a big time statement these last two games, Brady. And I'll tell you what, Jay, throughout the quarterback competition, it seemed like Taylor Green has just been fired up. He's got yeah. a little bit of an edge to him, running angry. I mean, that that rushing touchdown he had against New Mexico, he lowered his shoulders. It almost felt like it was personal. Something oh, that for sure. got me a little fired up because he's, he's usually not like that. When he was a starter early in the season, the first five games, oftentimes, by the way, starters are instructed to do this. Slide get down you have to worry about your health these last five games he has been running behind his pads he's been running with authority i do expect him even though he's a starter again i expect him to play the exact same way against utah state in logan today now i, I want to talk about this five game split from when he was the starting quarterback versus this this rotation that he's been in with maddox Matson. The first five games of the season, when it was mainly the Taylor Green show, his quarterback efficiency rating was right around 115, two touchdowns, two interceptions. His legs were always there, still productive as a runner, but not necessarily efficient as a thrower. 
You look at these last five games for Taylor Green, his completion percentage now up to 60%. That's about a 10% jump than the first five games. His quarterback efficiency rating up to 143. That's very, very respectable. They would take that any day out of the, of the week out of Taylor Green. He also has the element of his legs that he is still contributing, averaging over eight yards per carry as a running quarterback. Taylor has been very efficient over these last few weeks. He has to continue to do it with a bigger sample size coming his way today against Utah State. No doubt a key on our roadmap to victory. Bronco Roundup's roadmap to victory is sponsored by Treasure Valley Ford Stores. Yeah, I expect him to, to play at an extremely high level. I mean, again, of my years of doing this and working with quarterbacks, I'm not sure there'll be a guy that I'm more proud of. Green rolling the pocket, looking to throw. Long right side, receiver wide open, ball caught at the 18. Billy Bowens with his first catch, 16 yards on the strike from Taylor Green. From a preparation standpoint, he continues to just build and build and build. And I think everybody wants, you know, a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old to be a final product as a sophomore in college, but it's, it's not over always that and uh, again I, I think so highly of him uh, I feel like maybe I went through a lot when I was in college and it's probably a third of what he's gone through just this season alone that's going to be with him for the rest of his career his resiliency first and 10 green remains in he's going to keep it this time himself to the right side gets to the 10 cuts back inside and scores a 19 yard touchdown run for Taylor green green with a six rushing touchdown of the season and Boise State now up 28 to 14 with 9.04 to go in the half. Again, he is 1,000% about what this place is about and 1,000% about this community, and I think we're seeing that right now. Him and I talk probably every night for about 30 minutes just, just navigating this whole thing, and I think he's a unique guy in this because we'll look back on this, and, and certainly I want 90% of the blame to come right at me for for maybe this year, but I do want the self-reflection on his part too. You know, I'm hoping it's at Boise State, and as we know, whatever happens, what he's gone through this year will propel him for the future in college, for his NFL career, and, uh, and I just think, uh, you know, I think the world of him, as you guys know. Well, we're back live now on the field here inside Maverick Stadium. We've got to give you an update about Maddox Madsen because he will miss the rest of the season with an injury. On one of the final plays of the first half, Maddox appeared to have gone down, hurt his right knee, right? At that time, he was 6 of 11 for 202 yards and two scores, easily having the game of his life. Now, according to interim head coach Spencer Danielson, Maddox recently made the difficult decision to have to, uh, surgery this coming Tuesday, meaning he will miss the rest of the year. Unfortunate news because, as you can see, Maddox, who is here, sporting a pretty uh, gnarly knee brace, if you will, but wanted to be here in Logan to support his teammates before he goes in to get surgery to repair his MCL next Tuesday. Yeah, I mean, you hate to see a guy go down with an injury, but you love to see that Maddox is still being here for his team, going to support the Broncos. And I think it gets lost in the quarterback controversy, Jay. Maddox Madsen was a tremendous story in the Mountain West this year. A redshirt freshman, played well enough to earn some time on the field, challenged the guy who looks like he was the untouchable starting quarterback, and, and played great, stepped up to every opportunity and took care of business and supported Taylor as Taylor supported him throughout the competition. It was awesome. And it's tough to see it end by a knee injury. Nine touchdowns this season, three interceptions for Maddox Mats and a quarterback efficiency rating over 155. He was outstanding when the Broncos needed him to be outstanding. And now he is with his team on the field here at Maverick Stadium. As we shift our focus back to the coaching search, a, a more lighthearted approach to this one now too. Spencer Danielson showing off his character, never afraid to do so, Brady. Defense, you can you can play great for 65 snaps. If you play bad for three and give up 21 points, everyone's like, what's going on with the defense? 
That's just what it is. And knowing that you live on that razor's edge, if those five minutes went different, these conversations are different. And that's the razor's edge you live on defensively. The nose guard can screw up a play and probably nobody knows. The corner messes up, everybody knows, right? And it's just that razor's edge you live on. I mean, I've told you guys this all the time. Like, I know we've trained it, but we're gonna continue to find better ways to do it because you live on that razor's edge. Defensively, like we talked about, you live on that razor's edge. And so obviously we've given up some plays in the first half. I mean, you're on that razor's edge. You know, especially playing defense. You live on that razor's edge on defense. That's what I love about coaching it, because at any point, it's holistically, as a whole group, cornerbacks included, that's just that razor's edge you live on to where we can't have any lulls. And living on that razor's edge, because, and our guys be ready to play, because you gotta live on that razor's edge. We can't have any, oh, you're right, coach, I'll get a fix next play. Like, you have to be on that razor's edge. And, I, and I'm proud of how they started the game. I can't say it a wake up call, because it's just every week you live on the razor's edge. And that's just the nature of playing elite defense. Where you live on that razor's edge, where the difference between being a Elite and being average isn't a whole lot sometimes. Especially on the outside, you live on the razor's edge. And so it's just that razor's edge where guys that you have to always be on. And you're always in the fight. You always live on the razor's edge defensively. So because it is that razor's edge, there's no there's no reduce. But it does continue to show you the razor's edge you live on when you play defense. And we need to build that um, maturity to where that's the razor's edge you gotta live. You gotta desire to make it within the scheme. And so you have to live on that razor's edge of how you prep will give you the confidence to make those big plays and those big moments. But you have to live on that razor's edge and it has to be trained. Thanks guys. What an exciting moment. We have talked about that video for a long time. No better time than now to put it together as Spencer Danielson takes over as the interim head football coach. I'll tell you what, I want to share some other Spencer Danielson-isms with you guys because you're going to be hearing them the rest of the way through. One, he loves coaching these guys. He will tell it you every press conference uh, about how much he enjoys it, how much they are the light of his life. Another big one, you're talking about a young man is what how he will respond anytime you ask about a specific player the young man maybe they ask a lot of him maybe he does a lot for this team maybe he's just been great with his preparation taking a big jump next defense is holistic the whole group second you got to live on the razor's edge and then finally he'll double down man i love coaching these guys we put it there twice because he will tell you at least twice every time you ask him a question you can see Boise State's fearless leader right now out at midfield working with his linebacker group. He is a lot on his plate right now. Not only is he the interim head coach, not only is he the defensive coordinator, but he is still also the linebacker coach. Right now that unit is a little banged up. Marco Notriani going to be out for the rest of the season. That means they're going to have to lean, lean on an injured DJ Schramm to really kind of carry this group, along with Andrew Simpson, who's been playing out of his mind lately, but is also dealing with a broken hand that he suffered two weeks ago. Chase Martin, a true freshman, number 51, likely going to see playing time today, along with Jake Rip, number 43. That group's having to grow up in a hurry in order to help out Spencer Danielson in this defense. But you can see him right now talking to the linebackers. A pretty cool look. Nowhere else I'd rather be tonight. A, a, a message right there. One last one from Spencer Danielson to his linebackers, Brady. Yeah, it's 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 been impressive what they've been do, doing as a team dealing with injury. You got some young guys tonight who are gonna need to show what Boise State is made of as a developmental program yeah. as some of these freshmen get their opportunities. I want to jump over to an often overlooked position, Boise State. Their guy has erupted into the national spotlight. Last week, sophomore punter James Ferguson Reynolds was named a semifinalist for the Ray Guy Award. The award is presented annually to the top punter in all of college football. Ferguson Reynolds continues to make his case week by week. In fact, he's the first player from BSU to ever make it into the top 10 list. He currently leads the FBS with an average of 49.8 yards per punt. 18 of his 38 punts this season have been pocketed inside the 20. Those are unbelievable numbers. Don't forget, he also completed a pass, converting a fourth down two weeks back in Fresno. We talked to him about the honor this week. He's thrilled, but he's really just focused on finishing strong. Yeah, it's um, a pretty special moment for myself personally. Um, and like I said previously, it's, you know, I'm trying not to think about it too much until the season's done. Um, still got two weeks to perform and, you know, the, the elite of the elite get to 
do that every week and you know I'm up there with some pretty good names and, and guys that will get drafted this year um, so it's, uh, it's pretty cool being up there and, and being noticed so um, yeah just trying to execute my job every week and go out and do the same thing and, um, and yeah not trying to worry about it too much yet but um, yeah it's pretty exciting. Man, he has been so good all season long for this Boise State football team. Um, the best punter in the country. That, that, I mean, he really has been Brady. It's not like we're just suggesting that. Like, he really has been the most productive punter in all of college football this season. And it's so fun to watch. I tell you, I think Boise State fans are buying into the special teams because, one, what he does is so incredible and so unlike anything you're going to see from other punters. But, two, the team gets so hyped up with him. The celebrations that they have under the game are a ton of fun uh, after he knocks a successful punt, you know, within the five. And that's how they should be treating right? it because it's a big deal. Yeah, we're going to wait just a second here to go back down live to the field as the players kind of inch towards the final stages of warm-ups here in Logan. First off, though, I want to talk about Ahmed Hassanin, a guy that all of a sudden has really emerged to what near the top of the country when it comes to pressuring the quarterback, and certainly in the Mountain West Conference. Uh, he's one of the main pieces on this defense, along with that guy right there, DJ Schramm, number 52. DJ's been in and out of the lineup recently due to injuries. I would expect to see him in a limited capacity tonight as they are going to have to kind of lean on some of those other linebackers to help carry the torch while he continues to recover from an injury. You can see, though, Brady, the guys are in good spirits overall, though. That's kind of been the mood um, and one of the biggest takeaways this week for me. Despite all the change, despite all the chaos, these guys have responded well. And they seem happy. I have no other way to say it than that. Yeah, I mean, Boise State has always prided itself on the culture, the brotherhood. This is going to be the last two games where we really have that on full display. And I don't know how to describe it, Jay. The, the energy has just been different at practice. Guys are excited. They're excited to play for one another. They're mostly excited to play for these seniors because you look back at, like, not only has this been a crazy year, these are guys who went through the COVID season together. They've had a tough road. They want to finish on a high note, and the players on this team are going to do everything they can to make sure that happens, whatever it means to them. You can see Matt Miller, the wide receivers coach there, Taylor Green operating with the number one offense. This is kind of the point in time when we really start to understand who is going to be in the starting lineup for Boise State tonight. Up front, the Broncos appear fully healthy on their number one offensive unit. You can see Cage Casey and Cade Beresford, the two bookends at tackles. Ben Dooley is going to start a guard along with Garrett Curran. Mason Randolph in the middle snapping at center. When this offensive line is healthy, they are just one of the best in the league. They're one of the best in the country. They have been an absolute force this year. And I'll tell you what, Jay, even when they're not fully healthy, they've been extremely impressive because guys have needed to step up a couple times, and they've taken care of it. I think the dependable depth that they have built at that position not only has made the team better as a whole, but it, it's made the starters better. they got tough guys they have to compete with in practice, and it's been impressive. How about this Ashton Genthy line? up next to Taylor Green again the top offense out on the field warming up getting ready to go you can see Billy Bowen sliding over to play the slot receiver position he's lined up on the outside in almost every single game this season Austin Bolt sliding over to play the Z receiver spot that's gonna allow Prince Strawn to step into a starting role at the X receiver spot that's a true freshman that could be making his first career start tonight in Prince Strawn behind Prince Strawn kind of a cool story uh, Hunter Stecker, a Rocky Mountain walk-on that's only in his second year at Boise State, will be backing up Prince Strawn at that X receiver position. Kind of a cool story right there. Yeah, you know, a lot of local connections because obviously Austin Bolt, the Bora High School alumnus, the journey that he has put together to get back on the field. And, man, it's paying off both for him and for this team. First career touchdown pass last week against New Mexico. We're going to be excited to see that encore presentation tonight, see what Prince Strawn can do tonight. Uh, a lot of momentum with this group that looks a lot different than it did at the start of the year. Talking about some of the defenses, defensive changes to the depth chart as you see some of those guys out warming up on the field. Jake Rip and true freshman uh, Chase Martin. We mentioned this not long ago. Those guys are going to be the backups to Andrew Simpson and DJ Schramm today. They're both going to play significant snaps really maybe for the first time in their college careers on the defensive side of the ball tonight. I know Spencer Danielson really believes in those guys. 
especially talks very highly of Chase Martin. That kid has a very bright future, a true freshman that's going to play tonight for this Boise State defense. You know what, the thing that's kind of fun to take a look at is last year, this time when it was Utah State on the blue, Andrew Simpson was kind of a guy in that shoes, filling the Good role. Point. Ezekiel Noah was, was banged up. Uh, they had other injuries, and that was a guy who stepped up, and we were all looking around like, man, I wonder what that guy's going to turn into next season. Sure enough, he's kind of one of the centerpieces on this defense. So you got a pair of freshmen who I'm sure want to emulate what Simpson right? had done last year, want to be just like him, got an opportunity to take that step forward today. 20 minutes to go until kickoff. We are still live inside Maverick Stadium as Boise State has officially concluded their pregame warm-ups. The specialists will attempt a couple of field goals, and then it will be into the locker room for the final time. This is one where we'll see these guys for the final time right now before they emerge for kickoff. You know, I was kind of talking about the impact that Ahmed Hassanin has made. Spencer Danielson has really helped develop this kid, really believes in him, had a ton of praise for Ahmed this week. All of a sudden, Ahmed has climbed all the way to number two in the Mountain West in sacks. He has nine of them. That is the most in a single season by a Bronco since Curtis Weaver had 13 and a half in 2019. Also, Ahmed has at least one sack in six consecutive games and seven and a half total sacks over that time. Clearly, he has developed into one of the best pass rushers in the Mountain West. So proud of Ahmed. You talk about a guy that just tirelessly works, loves this program. When I talk about guys that want to finish strong, he's the guy that will call me. Motivated on focus. Came a long way from the lowest. Checking with me like whatever you need, we're finishing this thing. That's who he is. Dampier back to pass. Now the rush closes in and Dampier is going to be sacked. Hassanin. He does that in how he trains. He does that in how he practices. And I'm just so proud of him that now it's showing up in production on the field. Two tight ends shift to the right for New Mexico. Dampier with the snap. Dampier is going to be sacked. First sack of the game. He's a guy that I love coaching. I love being around. His teammates love being around him. You don't need to guess if Ahmed's going to show up and be ready to work and be, able to be ready to do his job. And there's a lot of things for him that he's going to consistently work to grow and even be better. And that's the exciting part for us is his best football is in front of him. All that pain, it made me to a monster. Been covering the Boise football team for quite a while, Brady. I don't know if I've ever remembered a player as passionate as Ahmed Hassanin. That guy wears his emotions on his sleeve. I don't know how many times he's told me this, and I'm starting to believe him that he would truly die for any one of his teammates. He continues to make that one of the, the main statements uh, in his press conferences, and at this point, I guess I believe him. Yeah, absolutely. When you take a look at uh, Ahmed, I remember that back at the beginning of the year, he was telling us, like, no, I want to. I was watching Aaron Donald in the NFL a couple months, uh, a, a couple years before, right after we moved to America, and I was like, oh, I want to be like him. He told his brother, like, hey, how do I get to the NFL? And within a span of a couple of years, became a good enough high school football right. player to become a college football player, the first ever from Egypt, and then has become a centerpiece on this defense. That's crazy. An That's just so out outrageous. Yes, an incredible story. In five years, he has gone from not even playing the game to the second best pass rusher in the Mountain West Conference. Hey, uh, from a guy that's all that's developing on defense to one that's really coming along on offense, Caden Dudley, a sophomore running back at Boise State, has made a special team's impact all season long. But over these last few games, he's really start, starting to see in his involvement uh, increase on the offensive side of the ball. And this week, in our latest edition of Cut Up with Kekala, he breaks it down. Take a look. What up, Buster? Matson back to pass, looking to throw, going it for Bolt. Bolt back to the defender, caught it in stride at the five, and scores. Austin Bolt with his first touchdown as a Bronco, 42 yards, 6 0. Back for another cut up with K Cala, New Mexico edition. Early on, Boise State 
on the offensive attack. For the third time this season, they score a touchdown on the opening drive. The thing I like about this play is it shows how they're kind of utilizing an unsung hero in their offense right now, Caden yeah. Dudley, and then the newcomer, Austin Bolt. Go ahead and take us through this one. Second and four, by the way, yep. New Mexico 42-yard line. This is right in the area where the offense can take their shot at going downfield, get an explosive play, and get into a position to score a little bit closer to your end zone. We start here in this formation. It's 21 personnel, right, it looks like. Two running backs, one tight end again. And then before the snap starts, boom, we shift guys around. So now we're in a totally different formation than we just showed. And you see what that does to New Mexico here. They start scrambling around. Hey, where's my new guy at? Where do I need to line up? And so just moving that little bit before the snap, Offense, we know exactly where we're going. These guys know as soon as we signal them, I run here, I go there. The defense, on the other hand, is trying to figure out where their keys just went. And so you see them in the back end looking around, where's my guy, where am I at? And then the next level to that is Caden Dudley, who we just talked about. Now we bring him in motion and send him flying across the field. And as a defense, you're like, I don't know if this is going to be run. I don't know if this is going to be pass. I don't know who I'm looking at because they moved two times before the ball got snapped. And in the offense's eyes, it's still simple. All we do is we zone max protect. And so everybody fans out on the offensive line. We have a tight end staying into block and both of our running backs staying into block. And Caden Dudley, instead of just running out to the flat, clearing out, he sits in here and makes a big block for the quarterback to give him just enough time to throw a two-man route to Austin Bolt, who, in a blink of an eye, is right up on that DB's toes, right past them, untouched into the end zone. And so I think this play is a product of what we show before the ball snapped. We shift people out of that. We get New Mexico moving around. They're trying to figure out where their guys are at. And then we move another guy again. And these defensive backs, as you can see here, they get all crossed up. Nobody's in the middle of the field. They got guys running into each other down here, not sure who they're covering, and that leaves our receiver wide open, one-on-one -on -one in the end zone. Ultimate chaos and confusion there. The thing I like about this play too, you can see Maddox Matson. Yep. You know, what makes him so good at times is his anticipation to throw the ball. Look at Austin Bolt's head when he releases this thing. Ball's yep. already in the air. Bolt's not even looking at him. His head comes up. Ball's exactly where it needs to be. Kind of, kind of throws him open there too. I mean, yep. it doesn't get any easier than that. 42-yard touchdown. Welcome to Boise State Football, Austin Bolt. That's right. Welcome to it. Here's the show. Dampier waits the snap. Has it. Hands it off to Henry, left side. Henry will get back to the one, maybe the two, and he'll be tackled there. Jumping over the defensive side of the ball. Highlighting a guy that has really started to come on for mm -hmm. this defense. Shale Ladipo playing the nickel spot. Yeah. Had seven tackles in this game, three tackles for loss. Guy that can come down, play up near the line of scrimmage. Kind of reminds me of somebody else who used to play on this defense. <laughs> near and dear to my heart. Right? This is my position right here. All right, I'm watching every time. Take us through this one. Yeah, so New Mexico here is backed up. And so as a defense, you want to pin your ears back here and play aggressive downhill, ready to stop a run and not let them get any positive plays. You know what, New Mexico does a good job of here to start is they come out in an unbalanced flop formation that we call it. And if you look real closely at it, they have all of their eligible receivers and numbers on one side of the field. So to the top, there's no receivers, running backs, or anybody that can get the ball up there. And they move their tight end over to this you know, field side of the play. And so what that does is it changes a little bit of what your run fits become as a defense. And you gotta account for new numbers and where guys are at. As a defense, you gotta understand that because with this guy on the ball, on the line of scrimmage, and that tight end on the ball in line of scrimmage, that means that this guy, he's not eligible to go and catch a pass down the field because he's covered by this guy here. And so as a defense, I know, hey, I don't have to cover this guy at all in the pass. And so that helps you think, I'm not worried about him at all getting the ball down the field. He's probably just there to block. And so that tells me before the snap, hey, this is probably a run play of some sorts because they canceled out a guy as a threat to go down the field and catch the ball. And so in these flop formations, it's imperative as a defense that you set really good edges. And so what Shea does a great job of here is he'll come down, they just run a zone play to the field with their other running back or fullback, you know, inserting to try to find the gap. All the offense is trying to do here is get some breathing room, get some positive yards. But what Shea does a great job of is, boom, you set the edge, look at how much of this field got cut off. Mm -hmm. Instead of having 
whatever this is here, you know, 25, 30 yards for the running back to run. He's got a five yard box because the nickel comes up, sets a great edge, but he also keeps that tight end off of him in the sense of he doesn't let him grab a hold of him, doesn't let him really get his block on there. So he's able to bounce off of that, come free essentially, and hit this running back on the one yard line. And all day as a defense, if you're playing in between the two hash marks, that's a win for you all day. You only gotta cover 15 yards in between those hashes. You don't gotta worry about running all the way to the sideline. Mm -hmm. You let your defensive linemen swarm to the ball. You let your linebackers swarm to the ball. And that's a win all day for Boise State's defense. Second and 14 mm -hmm. winds up third and 19. Yeah, you got Bronco Nation bringing it from the south end zone. Back this up once more because I also want to ask you about another player on this play. Boise State lines up a true freshman at the defensive end spot, Max Steeds, number 95, right in front of Shea Oladipo. Yep. This is a kid that has not been playing football very long at all. Comes over to the States. What do you think of, of his impact on this play? Look at how he makes this ball bounce back because of his penetration in that gap there. He gets straight up field, makes the running back shuffle his feet around, which makes the play for Shea because now he has time to hit this running back on the one yard line and look who's falling into him to bring him down. Second half shutout for the Broncos. Plays like this, big reason why. That's right. We appreciate one of the all-time greats at Boise State, Big Paula Canillo, a former three-time All-Mountain West defensive back sharing his football brilliance with us right there. Only a few minutes to go before kickoff, and it's time now for our keys to the game. I'm keeping this one simple tonight, Brady, and it is have fun. I can tell you about turnover margin, Taylor Green's completion percentage, which I do think is key. The closer to 60%, the better the chances are that the Broncos are gonna win today. But for me, it is simply have fun. This season has been a little bit of a drag at times. A lot of adversity, a lot of things to overcome. Have fun. Pretend you're like you're five playing football again. Make this game fun. I think that's an underrated key to the game, by the way, Jay. Sports are supposed to be, be fun, and you yeah. can have fun it, while you're doing your job and doing a good job at that. It's silly to say, but we also found out the results when you don't have fun. That's fair. That's true to say. What do you got? Well, mine's also pretty fun, believe it or not. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't consider this a necessity. It does not something that has to happen as a key to the game. Okay. Something I and a lot of Boise State fans would like to see, and that is a defensive lineman receiving touchdown. Scott Madlock did it twice. Two years ago on this field right here, and then last year on the blue. I think this is a great passing the torch moment for, to find out who the new guy is on the D-line to come out of the Clydesdale package and catch a touchdown pass from Taylor Green. My guess is that it's going to be Michael Callahan. He seems like the character to get it done. But I want to see it happen. I think that would be a lot of fun. And what a weird streak that they could keep going over yeah. the Aggies. Johnny Mallory told me that Michael Callahan gave me a shout out on the radio today. So shout out Michael Callahan. Big man touchdown by number 92 in Logan. Who this, doesn't this love a big man touchdown? It's I don't one know. of the most exciting plays in football. I'm going for it. Michael Callahan today. Hey, we'll have post-game coverage coming up live on Channel 7 once this one wraps up. Uh, on a special edition of the News at 10, which begins at 9, we'll have post-game highlights and reaction live from Utah State. Also, uh, right after the game ends, we'll be streaming Spencer Danielson's post-game press conference along with the players that are set to meet with the media. Check that out at KTVB.com. Been a fun day, moments away from kickoff. Again, stick with us tonight during the News at 10, which starts at 9 o'clock for highlights and reaction for Brady Frederick. I'm Jay Tusk. Enjoy game day, everybody. There aren't many left.